Hello everyone and welcome to part two of um, basically just all things credit reports, credit scores, um, and uh, yeah, just trying to get a better understanding of, of how everything works. So um, I came to the conclusion that I needed to do this because I was talking with my coworker um, the other day and we had a really good conversation um, about inquiries and that a lot of times I get borrowers that think that, oh, I don't want another inquiry on my credit score or on my credit report um, because it's going to hurt my credit score. And that's, you know, a key driver of it. And the truth is that they couldn't be more wrong. Um, and it's really become a pet peeve of mine um, because it seems like inquiries are something that's easy for someone to understand. And so they like to point to it as the item that is causing their problem um, rather than actually addressing the things that are causing their score to maybe not be as good as, as it is. Um, so part of what I wanted to show here was to go through the different categories that make up your credit and the, and specifically we're looking at the Vantage 3.0 scoring model from TransUnion. Um, and so the thing is to remember is that if you have a financial institution that offers you, you know, something that allows you to, to look at your credit and see what your score is, just know that it may differ from this. Um, it's going to depend on what model they use. Um, but in this case, if you have the Vantage 3.0 scoring model, this is going to fall in line with that pretty closely. And specifically, this is provided by Savvy Money, um, is who we choose to use at Canopy Credit Union. Um, so yeah, my goal is to be able to show people, um, what my credit history, um, essentially looks like, um, without getting into, you know, details that I don't necessarily want people to have. Um, and the other thing that's really important to remember too, is that I'm not boasting. I'm not here to try and, you know, show off how good my score is. I'm, I'm simply just trying to show how each of these categories, um, adds up to the total of your score and why a lot of people will misplace um, emphasis on something having an impact on their score while ignoring the thing that actually is having an impact on their score. And it kind of feeds into this um, cycle of, of someone just continually making bad decisions and making, making poor choices. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, let's, let's look at kind of um, the, what I have and, um, oh, and then going back to my example with, um, my coworker, Jessica, um, I had said, you know, I don't understand why people focus so much on inquiries as the thing that's impacting their score when inquiries on the TransUnion um, Vantage 3.0 model only makes up 5% of, of the actual score. And of that, the, I would say a heavier weight goes to new trade lines opened rather than just inquiries being made, but no trade lines being opened. Um, so even if someone's making inquiries, it doesn't mean it's going to result in a trade line. And if it results in a trade line that has other impacts across the other categories of someone's credit, um, that is, that is going to be more meaningful. And so would you study for a test focusing on what would is, what's going to be essentially 5% of the test, um, hoping that you get a good score, or are you going to focus on the 95% of things, um, that, that is likely to get you a higher score. And of those, there's different weights in the categories, and that's part of what we're going to cover. So when it comes to payment history, um, or well, let me take a step back. When it comes to the credit score model for the Vantage 3.0, we have payment history, credit usage, account mix, credit age, and inquiries, okay? So all five of these are what total up to the 850 possible points that you can get. Um, and by the way, I have never seen an 850 credit score. I think the highest I've ever seen is like an 843. And once you get over 800, there is no rhyme or reason that I can tell you, um, unless, uh, TransUnion would be so kind as to provide me their algorithm, um, which I'm guessing that they're not, um, and I wouldn't blame them for not giving it to me. Um, but without knowing what that algorithm is, I can't really explain to you why someone's at an 805 versus an 820. Um, all I know is that if you're over 800, you're crushing it, and there's really no reason 
for you to be so concerned about your, your credit or how you can achieve those additional points um, because those additional points actually don't do anything for you. They, they don't result necessarily in lower interest rates unless you have a weird financial institution that maybe offers like super low interest rates to people over 800. Um, but otherwise, um, it's, it's, it, it just means that you're a very high credit quality borrower. So when it comes to the payment history, um, that makes up 300 or 40% of your score or 340 points. Okay. Um, credit usage, um, category that is going to end up being, um, uh, basically what would be considered credit utilization. And that's going to be about 196 points of your score, 23% total account mix is going to be essentially depth of credit. Um, and that is going to be, um, uh, about 179 points of your score. And then for the balances, that's going to be about 94 points, which is 11%. And then recent credit, um, inquiries and trade lines, that's going to be about 43 points of your score. Yes, I did round those numbers up so that we're not working with decimals. So anyone who adds those up will notice that it is going to be higher than 850, but that is the reason why I, I did it just to simplify things. So when we get into the payment history, 40% of your score is based on on-time payments. So in my case, all six of my accounts are being paid on time. I have no collections and I have no late payments in the last 12 months. Um, part of the reason why this no late payments in the last 12 months is important is that um, I do have borrowers that have great credit scores who have had a misstep at one point in time. Maybe they moved, didn't receive their statement, and then forgot to make their payment. Um, it, it actually happens, I'm not going to say often, but it happens. Um, and so the thing is, is that a late payment in the last 12 months is going to be particularly negative versus a late payment that was made 13 months ago and happened one time and has never happened since again. So just know that there's a huge difference between an accidental late payment, um, especially if you recover quickly and make that payment as fast as you can, um, versus someone that is actively and currently late on their payments. Okay. Um, when it comes to my performance over time, you can see that, that I'm at 100% all the way through. So this is part of what reaffirms what we see on this page here of I don't have any issues in the last 12 months. If we saw a blip in that, we would see a negative impact that would come from this. But essentially, I cannot score any higher than I currently am when it comes to payments. Now, to put this into perspective, 40% of your score is 340 points. That means if somehow I manage to make all of my payments on time, but I'm maxed out on all my cards, I have really weak balance, um, uh, uh, different types of credit. And then with um, recent credit, I've been acquire, or inquiring for credit like crazy, but I'm making all my payments on time. Um, it is possible that you can have a very poor score. Um, so just because you have good payment history does not mean that your utilization, your balances and your inquiries look good, right? Or that your new trade lines look good because someone that is making all their payments on time, but continuing to dig deeper into debt, um, is someone that looks troubled, um, in a sense, or looks like they're headed the wrong direction and possibly headed for bankruptcy, which is the worst fear of any financial institution. So just remember that you can make all your payments on time, but there's, there's so much more to the other categories that impact your payment history um, uh, uh, in, in terms of, of where your score is going to fall. So for credit usage, um, this is 23%. So what it's going to look at is all the credit cards that I currently have open to my name. Um, and in this case, you can see where it'll show you the 30% mark, 50% mark, 100% mark. And this is where people who have very small limit cards and carry maxed out balances or over limit balances um, get into very deep trouble. Um, is that imagine if this JP Morgan card, um, I believe it's about a $3,000 limit. Imagine if that limit um, was um, $500 and I had a $500 balance on it. That would all of a sudden put me at 100% utilization. And so in this category that does make up 23% of the score, um, even though I may be doing well in these other categories here, it's going to look and see that 
on this one specific um, credit card that were maxed out and that is an issue. Yes, these other ones help offset it, um, but especially for someone who has very limited history and has mainly small limit newer credit cards, um, just know that, that hitting high on this this utilization um, is going to be something that's really concerning and if you look at the history here you can see that over time um, we we started using savvy money um, in june um, and you can see that we had at one point some higher purchases um, and the thing is i pay off the credit card every single month we don't pay any interest on the credit card it is a rule that i um, personally um, I have to live by it because it, it will drive me insane if we do. Um, but we did have some larger purchases that we made um, for our baby that we just had. And so the thing is, is that it's all about when it reports to credit. And so in this case, it's saying that I have this 12% balance. Well, even though I paid it off in full every single month, it doesn't mean necessarily that I pay, that at the time they checked that they'd received the payment yet. Also, it depends on um, when those charges were made and then at what time the payment is received. So it's really important to remember when you have small limit cards and you're carrying high balances, even if it's being paid off in full that month, that you're not getting the benefit for the credit usage category um, that you would if you were being more diligent about paying that debt down or making sure that what you spend on it is proportional to the limit that you have. As far as the account mix goes, um, you can see here that, um, you know, I, I think the, probably the most important point to make is that you can have car loans and a mortgage and no credit cards, and you will find that your score is going to be in some ways limited. And part of that actually goes back to the credit usage piece here, um, is that if you don't have any revolving lines of credit to be able to use, and then on top of that, you don't have the mix here, um, by not having a credit card, you are essentially um, preventing your score from being as good as it could possibly be. Now, the opposite is not true, where um, if you have credit cards, but you don't have a mortgage and you don't have an auto loan, you can still have a really good credit score because you're still satisfying the credit usage um, category, but you may not be fully satisfying the account mix category, which only makes up 11% of your score. So the thing is, is that if your first thought is, I want to get an auto loan because I heard it'll help my credit, um, false. Um, that is not true. Um, that is something where all you need to do is go get a credit card um, and, and have that credit card open for a certain period of time. Um, use it and pay it off. Or my favorite is just um, uh, don't even use it. Just make sure you're with a financial institution that actually um, will allow you to uh, keep your card open if you don't use it. Um, versus Capital Ones, Credit Ones, and those other places that will actually close it if you're not using it. So just remember that when it comes to the mixture here, um, yes, it is good to have real estate and auto loans, but it is not a justification for having a mortgage or having an auto loan to say that you need your credit score to be better. Um, prior to having the mortgage, um, that I have our score would have been probably about a 780. Um, so yes, did my score go up? Sure. Um, but at the same time, was was my credit score fine at a 780? 100%. Um, 780's great. I, I, between 803 and a 780, I could honestly care less. Um, so just remember that the mixture of accounts is not going to be nearly as important um, and especially avoiding collections, okay? So when it comes to your credit age, this one makes up 21% of, of your score. So this one is very misunderstood, um, and I'm gonna use an example here to, to help paint a, a picture of it. But you can see that my average age is six years and two months, but the average or the oldest age of my card is 12 years. Now, the I'm sure everyone has heard if you open a credit card, um, or sorry, if you close your oldest credit card, um, that it's going to hurt your score. And the answer is yes, it will. And the reason why is because this card carries a significant amount of weight when it comes to the oldest account versus my average age of credit. Okay, so average age of credit is just taking the number of years that are associated with each of your cards and um, adding them up and then dividing by the total number of cards that you have. So to keep the example simple, let's just say I have this 12 year old card and then I have a card that's two years old. Well, 12 plus two is 14. 
14 divided by 2 is 7. So if I, using that as my example, my average age of credit would be 7 years. Now, if I closed the 12-year card, then we would see that my average age of credit would drop from 7 down to 2 because now it's no longer 14 divided by 2, it's 2 divided by 1, which is 2. Now, take the opposite scenario. Let's say you close the card that's 2 years old. Now you go from being an average of, or a total of 14 years divided by 2 down to 12 divided by 1, which means that my average age would go up to 12. So hypothetically, I could actually go close all three of my other cards and I would actually end up with a higher average age of credit than I currently have today. So where this really comes into play is for borrowers that like to open up these small $500 limit cards on a regular basis, um, $300 you know, limit store cards, thinking that it's going to help with their credit. And what we have to explain to them is that, no, actually by closing this card, um, your one card that has four years of history on it will actually be worth more because you're not dragging it down um, by, by making your score actually get worse. So just remember that when it comes to your average age of credit, that makes up 21% of your, of your possible score that you can have. Um, and that's about 180 points um, that can be associated with that category. Now back to my least favorite category, inquiries. So with inquiries, as you can see here, I've made several inquiries. And by the way, these last two I specifically made to make a point. Um, we need to do some testing for something at work. And I said, frankly, I don't care. Pull my credit. I really don't give a shit what it does to my, my credit score. Um, and the reason why I did that um, is one, because we need the, you know, the testing to be done. Um, but two, I also wanted to prove a point that right now it gives me a grade of B. Okay? It's saying that my inquiries, I'm, I'm sitting on the high side of what's acceptable. Um, it's not that I've necessarily um, uh, gone overboard. Um, but at the same time, I haven't really opened any new trade lines. So the thing is, is that these recent inquiries, if that is what is having a negative impact to cause my score to be an 803, then maybe my score otherwise would be like an 805, maybe an 806. Um, inquiries are not the problem. Typically, what is the problem is that someone will focus on inquiries thinking that, oh, I don't want you to pull my credit again because it's going to hurt. Well, if you're applying for a loan, it's going to result in a new trade. A new trade is going to potentially mess with your average age of credit. It's going to mess with your account mix. It's going to potentially mess with your credit usage. And it's ultimately going to potentially mess with your, with your payment history. Okay, So when it comes to inquiries, you applying for a loan is already what's going to cause you problems if, if you're you know, taking out like a car loan. Um, for example, or if you're opening up a new credit card and planning on putting a balance you know, on that credit card, you are going to cause havoc with all of these other areas that make up 95% of your score. And even if you're making all of your payments on time, you're still messing with these three categories, which end up making up 55% of your score. So pulling credit does not necessarily hurt your score. Now, you can see here that it says that your last two years is when it's reported. Um, and by May of 2024, these two right here will have dropped off my credit um, report. And it'll be just these last two that are left here. And that's totally fine. Um, I would say that four hard inquiries in 24 months would be considered somewhat normal. Um, they want to see if they're spaced apart, that probably looks even a little bit better versus if you're doing a bunch at once. Um, but also here, if you're considering an auto or mortgage loan, all inquiries made within a 14 day time span for the same type of loan are counted as just one inquiry. So it's best to shop around. Now, what that doesn't mean is that if you take out a car loan and then you open up a credit card and you're using the same credit report, that is going to potentially have a negative impact on your score. Okay, this is not saying that open as many trade lines as you want with, with while using the same credit report. Um, what it means is if you're out shopping for an auto loan, you have the right to inquire with several financial institutions in order to find the best rate. There's nothing wrong with doing that. Um, but what it doesn't mean is that 
oh, now that I've opened up an auto loan, I'm going to go do a credit card and a signature loan and a mortgage and everything else that you could be a boat loan, RV, whatever other things your mind can possibly imagine. So again, inquiries only make up 5% of your score. And that is partly based on to the number of trade lines that you're opening. So if you're not opening any trade lines, inquiries has a minimal impact. And that is part of the reason why it really hasn't had much of an impact here for me as well. So one other thing that's kind of neat about savvy money too, um, is that we can actually go in and, um, that wasn't the category that I wanted. I wanted to see the score simulator here. Okay. So I can actually go in here and I can say, okay, what if I got a new credit card and it had a $10,000 limit? What would my score drop to? Hypothetically, it would drop five points. Now, what if I instead said I transferred credit card balances to a new card and I did $10,000? my score would drop 27. Well, the difference between the two is this is just saying that you opened up a credit card with a limit of 10,000 versus this one is saying you added another $10,000 in credit card debt that didn't exist, okay? So that's part of the reason here why you, you would see such a, a, a steep difference in terms of what the simulated score is. Um, on here, let's say we close my oldest card. Okay. So funny enough, look at this. It's really not going to have much of an impact on, on my score. Um, as long, assuming everything else stays the same. Now, if I increased my balances by $10,000, it's saying it would drop potentially by 20 points. Now, I don't know if this is a hundred percent, you know, accurate. I mean, I know that there's, there's, uh, you know, it's saying that it's, it's a simulator. Um, but also you can see where it's talking about, you know, what would it do if you paid down some of your balances? Um, in this case, I, I don't have any balances on the credit cards to pay down, but also notice how most of this is focusing on credit cards. Okay. And that's because credit cards are driving, um, your score. So let's say also too, um, payment activity. Let's say I missed one payment. Okay. This is one payment on one account. It is saying that my score would drop by potentially 67 points. Okay. So when it comes to making monthly payments on time, that 67 points is greater than the entire capacity or, or, um, uh, a hit that would happen um, by making inquiries and, and you know opening new trade lines um, that, that's associated with the five percent of your score. So just remember that that when it comes to this, you can really start seeing your score drop. If we say on one account it went two months, and then and then that same account went three months. So I could actually cause my score to drop by nearly a hundred points simply by missing my payments on one credit line for three months straight. Now, if I did that across all accounts, um, and I said three months, my score could drop to a 584. So if I basically just stop paying for everything altogether, um, I could wreck my credit, um, and it would be pretty easy to do. Um, not something that I uh, plan on doing anytime soon, but um, also, you know, if I go back to this and I get rid of this and I just say, what if I make on time payments for six months? So for my borrowers that have very limited credit history, um, you may see that the score will increase, but here notice that it's not going up even though I keep increasing it. And part of the reason for that is that it's just saying I've already maxed out my payment history. My, my, my goodwill that comes from the 40% of my score, that's 340 points. I have already utilized all 340 points of that portion of my, of my score. So Anyway, I just thought this was a helpful thing to, to end with. And again, um, find your financial institution, ask them if they have something like this. There are plenty of institutions out there that offer things like this. This is the, the one that we use. Um, it's free for our members. We, we do not charge for it. Um, and it's, um, it, it's definitely a helpful tool for better understanding the different categories. Um, but again, most importantly, 
understanding that your inquiries don't mean squat for the most part, as long as you're being reasonable about how many times you're applying and, and opening up trade lines reasonably, um, your inquiries are what lead to these other four categories having problems. Um, so look to the other four categories if you think the inquiries is what's causing your score to not be as high as it could be. So um, let me know if you have any questions in the comments. Um, I'd be happy to answer, answer any questions anything or if I went over something too quickly or if I misspoke about something um, since I'm not super high tech in editing these videos and and you know taking out stuff where I may have misspoken um, let me know um, because I, I make mistakes I am human just as well so anyway uh, thanks everyone for watching and I appreciate your time